Good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for joining us at the Nordic African Business Podcast for a conversation about cybersecurity in Africa. My name is Woody Keita Stamper. I'm the founder of EasyVat, a fintech startup based in France and China, uh, digitalizing VAT uh, collection. I'm also part of the team behind Africa Tech Summit, a series of events between Rwanda, UK, and China, um, and lately online, promoting African tech and founders. So I'm live with you today from sunny Shanghai, and uh, I will be your host. I will be joined by two very knowledgeable speakers and uh, on the topic of cybersecurity. Before getting to introduce them, uh, first apologies uh, for the Minister of ICT and Affairs of Kenya couldn't join us today, but he, he is replaced uh, by Timothy Mustoke, who is very knowledgeable on the topic that we have to discuss today. Um, maybe Timothy, you could tell us a few words on, on, on your, your background to start. Hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Great. I am having challenges with my video, but uh, we'll fix that shortly. Um, yes, my name is uh, Timothy Musoke. I am the Chief Technical Officer of uh, Laboremus Uganda, um, a software development firm specializing in uh, fintech, uh, or let's say financial technology software. Uh, we also have uh, own spin-off called Imata, uh, a fintech specialized in uh, providing financial services to uh, farmers, specifically in the dairy sector. Um, I am uh, um, quite uh, spread out on the tech scene in, uh, in Uganda, so I hope I can feel the big the ICT Minister of, of, of Kenya. Thank you very much, uh, Timothy. I will add that you are also overseeing the project for Uganda Bankers Association and the Central Bank that will allow financial institutions to verify IDs digitally. So I'm sure you will be able to fill in the shoes. My second speaker to today, um, also very knowledgeable on this topic, is Mrs. Tina Connor. She's a strategic analyst in cybersecurity at Control Risk. She's based in Copenhagen. And um, hi, Strina, maybe you can tell us a bit more about yourself. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, it's great to, to be here this morning. Um, so yeah, I, I work in the, as an analyst in the, in the cybersecurity team at Control Risk. So just to say a few words about Control Risk, we're a specialist risk consultancy. Um, really working to build kind of secure, compliant and resilient organizations. So what that means is we advise clients on a number of issues. So political risk, security risk, integrity issues and so forth, but also cybersecurity, which is um, where my expertise lies. Um, and really kind of what we do um, is to we, we advise companies on cybersecurity issues globally. Um, so I'm, I'm a threat analyst, so my, my remit is global, but we've worked with a number of, of foreign companies uh, investing and operating in Africa to kind of advise on the strategic cyber threat landscape in particular and kind of the key drivers and trends that we see shaping um, the cybersecurity threat uh, from, from a kind of business point of view. Uh, so that's that's kind of my my background, and as you said, I'm, I'm based in the region, so I work very closely with our Nordic client base in particular. Um, but as a company, we we have a presence kind of globally and and several offices in in African countries as well. Amazing! Thank you very much uh, for this introduction to our audience, because this is a conversation, you are very welcome to take part in it. And you can do this uh, in two ways, um, using the comment section to ask some question or give us some remarks. You can also answer uh, some of the polls that we will be uh, announcing uh, throughout the conversation. And um, so just to start getting into it, um, the 4.0 revolution in Africa is pretty much on its way with the 
with the very rapid exposure to new information and communication technologies. So according to GSMA Mobile Economic Report, by 2025, some 1 billion mobile connections will take place in Africa, with the sub-Saharan region alone counting for 130 million new subscribers, 475 million people will be using mobile internet by 2025. And um, to take the, maybe the example of Uganda, as we have Timothy with us today, um, he's a pretty much a mobile nation as well, with 70% of the population owning, more than 70% owning a mobile phone. And the uh, Bank of Uganda has reported recently a record number of mobile transactions in the first half of this year alone, uh, with an increase of 19% of uh, active users for mobile mobile transactions. So it is very uh, easy to, to talk about the benefits uh, that new technologies are bringing to Africa from uh, improved accessibility to boosting nations' economies, to name just a few. But it is also very uh, known, and that's why we're here today, that this increased exposure to ICTs comes with more exposure to cybercrime. And just to throw in some figures, but I will then let uh, Tina and Timothy give you more on that. Uh, this year alone, uh, in the first eight months, 28 million uh, malware attacks were detected in Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya together. Um, so Uganda also had its share of cyber attacks, uh, and Timothy, I'm sure you have more to say on that uh, later. And throughout Africa, uh, yeah, so, so Africa is an emerging digital nation. It seems that the exposure to cyber crime is quite um, important in comparison to very developed nations, for example. So it is very fair to ask the question, is Africa ready when it comes to fighting cyber crime? So I will start with you, uh, Tina, if you don't mind, if you could just give our audience a, um, a picture of uh, what is the landscape of uh, cyber threats that, that we can see today in Africa. Absolutely, yeah, thanks very much for this. So I think we, we, we kind of need to start by saying it's maybe one on a regional basis, maybe one of the more diverse cyber threat environments, uh, if we compare to kind of some of the more, more um, high risk regions um, that, that we look at where some countries are facing still fairly limited uh, challenges, um, whereas others have much, um, much bigger challenges. So in particular, if we look at the larger economy, so you mentioned uh, South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria, which is also where we see kind of the highest uh, cyber risk at the moment. Uh, so that's just worth uh, bearing in mind as well when we talk about the kind of the threats that we're seeing uh, the issues and, and also the level of preparedness uh, in that respect. But certainly, uh, if we look overall in terms of the key trends, uh, there's certainly an increase. I think that's that's something that we've been seeing for several years now. Um, and a key driver for that, as you say as well, is around the kind of increasing digitalization and internet penetration, um, which makes this region more attractive to kind of cyber crime overall. Um, another of the, the key kind of drivers that we're seeing from, from a macro perspective, so to speak, is around geopolitical competition and how that, um, how that plays into to the cyber threat environment. So I think we can, we can maybe dig into that a bit uh, later. Um, but when it comes to cyber crime and um, what we're seeing in terms of the nature, um, we're still seeing the kind of the most frequent types of cyber crime is fairly... Uh, low level in terms of um, the, the kind of technical sophistication that's needed. So a lot of this is focused on kind of mobile enabled fraud, uh, social engineering for kind of financial uh, purposes. Uh, that's, that's certainly the most frequent issue um, that we're seeing. And, and a key factor here is the kind of widespread and, and quite rapid adoption of, of kind of mobile payments um, across the continent. So, so that's that's kind of one, one aspect of it. Um, but I think what we're looking at as well from that kind of strategic and, and, and um, 
kind of business point of view is also around kind of evolving regional uh, cyber criminal ecosystems in a number of countries um, across the region um, where these groups are kind of gradually improving their capabilities um, focusing on more impactful attacks um, so really kind of that, that emerging trend of going after organizations as opposed to perhaps individual end users, which is still the predominant uh, form of cyber crime. And in particular, not coming back to the larger economies, this is where we're seeing this most um, notably. So Nigeria is a very good example. Um, and kind of adding to that is the kind of cross pollination um, that we see between local cyber criminal networks and the kind of the wider cyber criminal community, if we call it that, but the kind of the global um, uh, threat actors uh, that are active here. So really what that does is it, it kind of feeds into um, groups that tend to have lower technical sophistication of attacks or resources to kind of develop uh, say their own malware or tools to conduct these attacks by gaining kind of gaining access to um, these tools by underground marketplaces. So really that exchange uh, between kind of international cybercrime and, and, and local and regional cybercriminal groups. So there was a recent uh, interesting example uh, in Ghana, uh, an attack uh, against a bank where uh, a number of kind of local criminals were arrested but where kind of the access to that bank was likely purchased from a more sophisticated actor through underground marketplaces so kind of enabling factors in, in that respect so i think that's that's an interesting trend and what we're also just to to, to kind of in terms of the, the emerging trends we're seeing, what we're also seeing is around foreign uh, cyber criminal groups um, kind of increasing their interest in the region. So typically um, the, the, the most advanced cyber criminal groups globally will have targeted Europe, North Africa, parts of Asia, the more kind of wealthy um, uh, countries. Um, but really moving into other regions of the world as well. So we're seeing this uh, in Africa, but we're also seeing it um, in, in a number of other uh, regions. So, so Southeast Asia, um, Latin America as well. So there is that added dimension as well. And this is something that we're seeing emerging. We're not seeing as frequent attacks as, as uh, in some of the more established targets, but certainly something um, that plays into to the cyber threat environment uh, as we see it. So I think um, I'll, I'll kind of stop there um, for, for what we're kind of seeing from, from the, the bigger macro picture of things. Um, yeah, that, that was very insightful uh, and thank you for that. Um, Timothy, maybe we can stay on the same uh, high level picture. Uh, you could help us get a picture on the Uganda side especially uh, given that you are very active in the Uganda Banking Association. What is the landscape of uh, cybercrime uh, on your side? Um, Seems Timothy is having a bit of a microphone issue. I'm not sure you can hear us. Um, well, we we'll wait on Timothy to to check on those technical issues, and um, I will stay with you then, uh, Stina. To uh, uh, going further, you were talking about uh, the techniques being not that sophisticated, um, yet uh, I guess quite impactful uh, in terms of. Uh, economical cost and um, generally would you say that the increased usage of ICT has accelerated cybercrime and not just in terms of numbers but also in terms of impact? Yeah I mean I think certainly um, it's it's one of the key dimensions uh, when we're looking at, at the kind of the, the threat environment. I think one of the key um, the kind of the interesting components here is around 
what type of technology is being used and how that is then being kind of leveraged by threat actors. So I mentioned uh, kind of mobile focused threats. So that very much comes down to the fact that there is kind of widespread use of kind of mobile payments and the use of, of um, mobile technology. Uh, so, you know, the focus is around um, fraud that can target kind of mobile mobile users. So one of the um, particular types of attacks that we're seeing is uh, swip, um, SIM swap uh, fraud, which specifically targets kind of mobile um, mobile devices and really is a type of, of, so this comes down to kind of what I said about technical capabilities, that this is very much a social engineering uh, scheme. So it's about convincing um, uh, a user or mo mobile operator to kind of switch um, a phone number so that attackers gain access to it and can use that to, to then um, uh, on kind of access banking details and bank account and so forth. So very much kind of focused on um, a specific uh, technology in that sense. Um, so certainly I think, you know, looking at, at, at um, both both the frequency, but also the, the impact and, and of course, with uh, more exposure to, to kind of, um, to digital services and so forth, comes more exposure to, to kind of um, cybercrime. Thank you for that. Um, while we, um, we see if we can maybe help Timothy with the technical issues, um, I just let our audience know that the first poll is, uh, is sent. According to you, is the level of cybercrime a KPI when investing, uh, making an investment decision? Uh, we will be very happy to know your thoughts on that. Uh, you can start answering the poll question. Welcome back, Timothy. I hope you can we can hear hear you this time. Not sure. I hope so. Yeah, we do. So that's great. Um, great. Do you still have the question in mind, or would you like me to repeat it? Sorry, what did you say? The question, uh, uh, the previous question that Stina already answered was uh, she was she gave us uh, a high level picture on at the continent level, and I wanted to to have your take on Uganda part, uh, especially given your closeness with the Uganda Banking Association. Could you give us a picture uh, of the country when it comes to cybercrime? Yes. Uh... Thank you for that. Sorry for the audio and video. Um, I think uh, Uganda or even um, African perspective, the group right now is um, digital financial services. Um, the majority of the population, when it comes to digital, this is one of the areas that they're most exposed to. You, you mentioned some statistics earlier. 70% of the population, one way or the other, have access to uh, mobile phones. Um, digital financial services has evolved quite a bit. Uh, you hear buzzwords like mobile money. Um, so it has translated into the, the banking excuse me, the banking sector. Um, so I think when it comes to Africa and, and, and cybersecurity, the areas um, of big concern are uh, fast digital financial services as, and, and of course they tend to be accessed through um, mobile devices. Uh, just a couple, of, uh, a couple of days ago, um, we had a huge uh, uh, break-in or hacker activity where uh, the two largest telecoms, the largest bank, and the payments aggregator were involved in, uh, in, uh, in a cyber fraud where uh, over a billion uh, Uganda shillings was you know, stolen. Um, this is something that has been happening for quite a bit uh, last year the report from the police 
there were a number of other banks uh, that were involved and they all tend to be rotating down um, uh, payments um, mobility um, so when you in, in um, to put everything in, in perspective, when we talk about uh, cyber threats, cyber security, uh, from an African perspective, I'm sure this is a problem in other parts of the world, uh, but Africa has kind of skipped some of the, uh, the, you know, the trajectory that other companies are about to go through, you know, the desktop computer, the laptops and all that. Yes, they're there. Uh, but the largest footprint uh, when it comes to exposure around um, mobile, particularly uh, when you look at the services uh, uh, people are doing um, on their mobile phones that are related, that are most exposed to cybersecurity, is uh, the digital financial services. So you are saying. I often hear that the leapfrogging aspect of uh, African uh, digitalization is a good thing, but you're actually saying, are you saying that this actually accelerates um, the exposure to cyber crimes? Um, the, the, the pace at which um, these digital financial services and, and mobile usage is Accelerating uh, is quite is quite alarming. It's, it's if uh, I'm not sure of the statistics, but uh, I would compare it with uh, with uh, East Asia. But I don't think it's growing any faster uh, anywhere in the world than it is here. Uh, by 20, uh, 2025, there will be half a billion mobile devices um, on the African continent. Those are smartphones. I'm not talking about feature phones. I'm talking about smartphones. Uh, the, and, and of course, uh, if you talk about Africa and, and you look at what people are doing, as I said, the, the one part, for, for there to be cyber threat, there has to be bad actors. And those bad actors are interested in, uh, in uh, certain interests and, of course, the number one tends to be uh, finance. Uh, so obviously, as Africans get onto these uh, very well advanced devices, um, they are also, uh, you know, directly exposing themselves to the risks that come with, uh, with, with cybersecurity. So you can talk about the leapfrogging as an advantage. Uh, the disadvantage is this pest no one uh, is, you know, doing a big enough job to um, prepare uh, these individuals to, to be ready for, for, for these threats that the advanced parts of the world have actually been used to for quite some time. Very, very interesting. Um, I just take uh, the opportunity of talking about leapfrogging. Um, Stina, maybe you can help us uh, compare because leapfrogging is very specific to Africa, but how does actually the continent compare to other nat nations when it comes to cyber security and, and cyber crimes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a really interesting point. And I think, um, you know, the, the problem is that also that, that cyber criminals are extremely quick in taking advantage of opportunities. So if they spot an opportunity, they'll be there. So in terms of the kind of um, mobile malware, for example, and the development of that, we've seen that um, globally uh, for quite some time. And of course, again, with this kind of exchange, it will be brought in and, and kind of leveraged when, when the attack surface increases so rapidly. Um, kind of in, in terms of you know mobile um mobile payments and, and, and so forth so just in terms of kind of where africa sits uh, in the global perspective so i think um certainly we're seeing uh, still a lower number of kind of high impact attacks um in kind of in the continent compared to other regions 
So again, you know, when we talk about cybercrime, really the, 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 the kind of key target regions have been North America, uh, Europe and, and parts of Asia, as I mentioned, where, you know, cyber criminals will, will typically follow the money um, and target kind of um, the, the, the wealthier countries. Um, but I think this is also down to, to exposure and, and the level of digitalization and kind of internet penetration. So it is something that, you know, is, is changing quite rapidly. So I think if we talk about kind of leapfrogging, you know, the, the, the development there went more hand in hand, right? It didn't come, the, there wasn't highly skilled uh, cyber criminals uh, from the very start of, of in these regions, but it was something that kind of went hand in hand. So as um, cyber criminals got better, you know, organizations and, and, and governments kind of tried to adapt to this. So it was it was more of, of um, a kind of evolution in that sense. Whereas when, you know, um, kind of the African region is now kind of very rapidly adopting um digital uh, services and solutions and kind of increasing quite significantly and quickly in terms of the, the number of users um that that isn't necessarily there you know there's already a, a very kind of globalized cyber criminal market space that can be tapped into by by kind of local cyber criminals in a fairly straightforward manner um in many cases um so so there's certainly that dimension to it. Uh, I think when we, when we compare, especially around, you know, the cybersecurity preparedness and, and the kind of um, where with the state of, of, of cybersecurity. Okay, very, very interesting. Before um, we jump into maybe the, the more economic impact uh, aspects, just take, the, take a look at the polls, the results are in, so you are, 63% to answer um, no, that is not a KPI that you look at when you are making an investment decision. So do you, I'm staying with you still on this one, but because you're facing corporates who are um, asking for analysis on cybersecurity and advices obviously on, the, on how to fight cyber crimes. You see that this is something not enough at the top of the, the topic list when, when people are going to open new markets uh, or throwing themselves into new industries? I think it's it's um, certainly getting there. Um, we're, we are seeing that shift where there is a higher attention at, at uh, kind of board level and, and, and highest management around cybersecurity. But cyber is one of those issues that have it, it, it's tended to be siloed into kind of a, um, an IT issue space. Whereas when we look at the type of attacks that we're seeing now, at least in, in some parts of the world, where really we're talking about operational disruption, we're talking about, you know, very, very significant financial costs for organizations, it needs to be considered as much more of, of kind of a business risk, a strategic risk and something to factor in on more levels, um, so so there is a shift, um, and and certainly from my point of view, it, it should be uh, part of that part of that equation, um, be, because of just because of the scale of the problem, um, obviously because of of the potential impact that it can have, uh, both in terms of, of financial impacts, but also on, on kind of reputation regulatory and legal implications if you kind of lose data or, or um, and so forth. So, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's getting there. Uh, I think it's uh, what we're okay. uh, Timothy, this is, is this something you are also uh, used to facing when you come in a room trying to explain cybersecurity and how, why it's important to fight cyber crimes? Um, this, the fact that it's not really a very popular topic. Uh, yeah, it's uh, quite an interesting concept. As I said at the beginning, we, we work with banks. We, we make technology for banks. So the moment you have a proposal in front of an executive, in, 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 in front of a bank, 
executive of a bank, they will tell you something like, uh, what about security? It's usually one of the first thing they say. Uh, so you believe, ah, you know, these guys are very conscious about the security, you know. So then you start doing the work. Um, so one of the things, of course, we do is knowing we're doing work uh, for, for these financial institutions, we, we try to, you know, lay a very broad uh, foundation in terms of dealing with the security teams early on uh, to understand what are the policies, what are the do's and don'ts. The immediate thing is there is always one junior security guy. And this is at least as far as Africa is concerned. And they're the only employee in the entire multi-billion bank. Uh, that are responsible for overseeing this, uh, this, this security threats that the, the, the entire institution faces. Um, so, of course, you quickly realize that things to do with governance, uh, as far as, as the security is concerned, are, are largely uh, are missing. Um, processes. Uh, so, so, you just realize that, okay, these guys check this seriously when there's a breach and there is uh, something in the news, and then for a couple of days, um, you know, they try to ask, okay, what do we do, what do we do? Uh, hire an external firm to come and do an audit, um, and that's usually the central bank is saying, I hope all of you financial institutions, are, uh, you know, your secure, uh, you know, fences are, you know, up and running, so everyone kind of rushes to try to do a quick, uh, a quick audit and, and penetration testing and, and all that. And then the new everything goes back to normal, your junior security guy until the next, um, the next uh, incident happens. So I think, to put it in, uh, on an African versus global perspective in terms of is Africa ready, um, the has experienced this long enough that the knowledge has been carried from from old executives to new executives and there's been enough bad incidents um, that the investors of these institutions firstly and institutionalize and here um, the executives only just learning about technology I think it's already too much to ask to uh, um, this is me being cynical, it's pretty too much to ask them about uh, the intricacies of, of, of cybersecurity. They know it can be dangerous, but they have no clue what to do um, to actually make sure these organizations are, are secure. And, and that uh, is, I think, uh, a, it's going to be a while before Unless you have the top management, um, you know, and, and the shareholders of institutions taking this matter really seriously, it's unfortunately time with with uh, so many more bad incidents before you know we think we, we can talk about being ready. Very, uh, very insightful and actually take me back to the times in China when we were building risk uh, BCP, like business continuity plans, and we were thinking in a situation where nobody could go to the office, what, how we should work. And because risk is always something imaginary, people really don't get into it until there is an incident. So nobody told that the situation can happen. And today we are all in this situation where we have to learn to walk outside of the office. And I just take your last sentence on Timothy. When you say they have no clue uh, what to do, uh, I want to ask what to do. Uh, then it will be interesting to get your uh, take on, on that as well. What, is the, what are the best practice you are seeing uh, when it comes to fighting uh, cyber criminals? Well, um, I'm not a, a security expert, but you're working in tech, obviously, um, uh, you know, there's, there, there are some basics that, um, you know, usually these, these uh, breaches 
are not some super coordinated Russian initiated through some other country, whatever. It's some uh, basic weakness in, uh, in 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 the organization. You know, I I, I like to give. We we were implementing uh, a system for a bank, and um, so we had this issue of, of people forget their passwords. Um, another uh, way to uh, to uh, remember some people. So let's put a P password so people don't uh, you know long passwords. And what find pinned on the monitors of it because some IT administrator gave them a very long password with so many weird characters and there's no way they can remember that so they write it on a stick and, and put it in front of their uh, of their monitor um, so and, and, and of course this is the password to the core banking system okay um, so <clears throat> Basics like just awareness, you know, like, uh, of course, you can't have awareness unless this is starting from the top and, 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 uh, and the whole cyber uh, awareness is institutionalized um, right from the board to the CEOs and there's just general policies and governance around what do we need to do even if you just do the minimum, and you just talked about passwords, Banking password should not be on a sticky note and, and in front of a, of, of a, of a computer. Uh, so I think, um, you know, for just getting at the executive level, that alone will just take you, um, it will leapfrog you already. And then when that is done, it means there's the backing in terms of financial and resources to make sure uh, that the things that need to be done uh, are done. And what are those things? Those things are known. These security frameworks, their governance frameworks, the kind of people to hire are known. Um, and, and if you just do that, you are already alleviating more than half of uh, issues that, that you have to but, but maybe Stina has more specific technical things that uh, that, that you can talk about um, yeah just before uh, joining uh, just before uh, getting to you Stina I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Esbon Malwayi who is representing um, the cabinet secretary of uh, Kenya ICT minister uh, his excellency Joe Musheru uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is pretty much a conversation, so welcome to the table. Thank you for having me. Um, would you mind just maybe giving uh, our audience a bit of uh, uh, what you do so that we can pin it in the topic of cybersecurity that we have been discussing for a little while? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for joining in late. Uh, my name is uh, Hezbon Malouin. And uh, I'm the Minister of ICT and the Director of ICT. And uh, try to deal with uh, the issues of cyber security as well. Uh, though Kenya, the way we are organized, of course, at the moment, we now have the Cyber Command, and uh, which is looking at the bigger picture of uh, what is happening in the cyber security in Kenya. But within the ministry, because we give the guidelines and policy at the ministry, then that is what we are also involved in. And uh, other than the cyber security, of course, we deal with other things within the, uh, the uh, ICT space. And I'm glad to join you uh, this time. I can see you've covered quite some ground. But I'm glad to join at uh, any point. Thank you very much for doing that to me shortly because I'm sure our audience um, here to know what we are doing in Kenya, Kenya being one of the most powerful uh, countries in Africa when it comes to cyber crime. Uh, before getting back to you, I will just let uh, the opportunity to Stina to answer to the previous question, which was, what are the best practices that you are seeing uh, when it comes to fighting cyber crime? Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think. Um, 
you know, this is this is quite a, a long and detailed list, but I think what Timothy mentions around awareness is really, really critical. Um, not not just in the African context, but but there in particular, given how much of of cybercrime relies on types of social engineering and and, and fairly, um, you know, that type of of kind of initial access. So raising awareness around, you know, what 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 types of threats what what does it look like um and and how can it be easily mitigated is, is is really key um part of that but i also think from a more kind of organizational perspective um again you know taking it to, to that highest level and actually putting priority to it and seeing this as as uh, a really a business risk as opposed to kind of something that is siloed in it or or thinking about in isolation, but really kind of integrating it um, on that level. And certainly that's um, what we would be advising organizations to, to be doing, um, to really kind of look at, you know, what are what are the what is the actual landscape, what what are your your kind of key assets here and, and how do we protect that from from a more strategic point of view. Okay, well, um, the, as we Actually, um, Mr. Malwegi, you are joining us right on time because yes. we were just uh, moving towards discussing uh, the, the different stakeholders when it comes to cybersecurity, and obviously, government is a huge part of that. So, before heading to letting us know um, what role government could play uh, or is playing already when it comes to fighting cybersecurity, you could maybe give us a quick landscape of. Uh, uh, what is going on in Kenya when it comes to cyber crimes and also regulations related to cyber security? Okay, thank you very much. And uh, really, the government uh, has a major role to play when it comes to cyber security because uh, cyber security is a cross cutting thing, uh, the cyber threats within throughout the economic uh, landscape as well. And therefore, there are various uh, players when it comes to the issue of uh, uh, cyber security. And in Kenya as such, the government has a major role to play in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, the, the, the threat is, uh, uh, the threat is uh, uh, of cyber security is, uh, is, is, is actually tackled. And uh, the, at the government level, what we do is, uh, one, we have to coordinate uh, coordination in such a way that uh, we are the people with the infrastructure. We have to look at the bigger picture and see how do we coordinate the incidents uh, that the, that uh, uh, we, we, we get to see in the cyber in the cyber uh, um, in the cyber. And two, we got also as a national, we are entrusted with the responsibility to, to look, to be the point of contact. When there is an issue, where do people go to? As a government, therefore, we've got to see how we help in tackle such. We've got other matters that come and uh, advisory, we have to advise, uh, uh, make sure that uh, we, pro we, we promote, uh, provide the various information related to the cyber incidents. And uh, every time we do the monitoring of the incident and then we plot and we have to tell people what is happening on a monthly basis, that is what we do. Uh, and uh, you can see how if the, the threats, uh, the incidents are more or they are dropping. And therefore with this, what do you do? You have to analyze, you have to do a research analyze and then inform people what they need to do. And uh, I, I could see uh, Musoke and uh, Kona are discussing about the awareness. This is a major area because people now are on the internet and majority of them are not aware what the, uh, the risks uh, that uh, come with the, being on the net. Much more even organizations. You have organizations which are there and uh, they do not 
have either because of ignorance uh, or they do not know what steps do they need to take to uh, in the area of cyber security. One, just from uh, the, within the organization itself, what do they need to do? Do they have the cyber hygiene? And uh, it is important that the capacity is built. The capacity is an issue, yes. How do you go about it as a government? Because everyone now is using the net, and especially in this era of COVID, uh, everyone has been on the net. Now, how do you inform the users about the cyber security so that they are secure? And uh, even when they are carrying out their business on the net, how do they feel that they are secure? Because feeling secure and being secure also is something that is uh, very important. Someone knows that there's someone on a watch and therefore I can do transactions on the net. So the government has that uh, responsibility uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that the stakeholders are well informed and the stakeholders are playing their role as it were and ensuring that also the larger uh, citizen are well informed on uh, what do they need to do when they're on the net. Uh, maybe hand it back to you. Thank you very much uh, for, for this detailed answer. Um, staying with you as you just joined us, uh, what kind of government and private sector partnership do you think there should be in uh, fighting uh, cyber crime? And a second question uh, as we are getting close to the end is, um, Obviously, cyber crimes uh, do not know any borders. Do you think there, there should be a larger cooperation at the continent level when it comes to fighting uh, cyber crimes? Yes. Uh, one, what, we, what we've got to say, like in uh, each country has their own responsibility because this is a security issue. And therefore, you need to have at your various gates, whether it's through fiber, whether you are talking of um, uh, if you are talking of satellite, you need to have these gates and you need to keep watch on that. But also what we are saying is that on the larger picture as a continent also, because there are those things which we do uh, and uh, are integrated, like maybe you are talking of immigration issues, you are talking of cross-border trades. So you are saying there is need of all those stakeholders who are involved to come together in terms of combating the cyber threats. And uh, uh, within the Africa, we have the blocks. And within the blocks, depending on what you are doing, you may have to discuss about how do we uh, counter the threats when it comes to the migration issues. How do we do it when it comes to the trade? Especially now, people are, uh, are, uh, are, are, are uh, the, especially the mobile money at the moment and all that. So you need to bring all these stakeholders. And when you do that, of course, there are other, as a government, at a government level, the other banking sector has to come in. You've got the migration people could come in. The security people also have to be brought in. And those ones who are dealing with the cyber security command also have to be on board so that uh, all these things are interlinked and you are able to do this within one front uh, in terms of combating the, the threat. Very well. Um, maybe, Timothy, you will ha also have a take on that question as you're um, sharing a such kind of a mixed group uh, designed to finding solution to cyber threats. Uh, what kind of cooperation between private and government uh, do you think works in fighting cyber crimes? Uh, I don't know if I got your question. Are you saying the type of cooperation that does exist between the I'm government sorry. and I'm, the private? My bad. I was actually uh, heading back to uh, Timothy. I'm not. I'm not sure you can hear us very well. Oh, it, it seems Timothy has uh, some connection issues. Then I will get back to you, uh, Tina, on the same question because you have a. Sorry, you're back. Yeah. Good to have um, you here. Uh, so from, uh, yeah, I think we 
have to deal with this in uh, in um, uh, as husband was saying, looking at what the roles of the different stakeholders have to play. Uh, what I have seen work is when uh, because the largest players are be the private sector. So if but the private sector are profit driven. Um, however, the private sector is regulated by policies, um, you know, laid out. By the so starting from the top, if government um, is able to play its role, and, and, and the role that I think they can play is, you know, policies, rules, and regulations in place, you know, that are in line with the, with the, the trends of the day. Uh, so that is one. The other thing is we have in in most parts of Africa now, at least if I should speak for Sub-Sahara, we are still exposed to an education system which uh, large elements of, of of the same is is, is still missing. Um, I, I can use myself. Um, the kind of things that I was being taught in school. Um, are not in line with the, with the challenges that we we, we face uh, in in the world today. That's a very general statement, um, but uh, there there has to be, you know, um, uh, I should say a refresh of 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 of, of the way you know uh, education is carried out, especially when it comes to technology um, and and the threats that that come along with that. So from there, I think that's the role of government. And from a private sector uh, perspective, you know, it's you know, you, you look at risk, and risk is money, as the financial people will tell you. Um, it, risk may be looked at something in the future, but, but it will happen. That the examples that I gave, and billions lost in 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 transactions. Yes, if you don't invest now uh, in in uh, trying to get your your um, your systems in order, uh, you will have financial um, uh, loss. Thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, Sinazvi, it's almost time to wrap up. I'm just going to give you the results of the, the last two polls, which are very similar. Um, do you think that COVID-19 has, has increased cybersecurity threats? 75% of our audience have answered yes. And to the question that is uh, the topic of our conversation, uh, cybersecurity, is Africa ready? 75% thinks that is no. So um, I would ask the three of you uh, as a conclusion to our conversation uh, to let us know your view on the impact that uh, COVID-19 had on the cybersecurity threats and your own take on the topic question, is uh, Africa ready when it comes to cybersecurity? Starting with Justina. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's interesting results. So I think just starting on the on the COVID side, certainly we've seen a number of, of kind of different COVID related cyber threats, but really what's happened is it's kind of accelerated and intensified trend that we've seen already. So I think in the kind of in the African context, what happened in a lot of countries was that there was kind of a very sharp acceleration in, in provision of digital services, for example, uh, different kind of e-solutions e that needed to be implemented fairly quickly. So again, we're coming back to the kind of the rapid um, digitalization and, and the kind of attack surface increasing quite significantly. So certainly that's something uh, from a COVID point of view to, to, to um, that kind of accelerated what we're already seeing in terms of the, on the on the threat environment. Um, I think in terms of if, if, if um, you know, if is Africa ready as, as a final question, I think, you know, there's a specific set of challenges that we've discussed here and it is an extremely complex cyber threat environment and it's, it's very fast moving, which I think is one of, of the key issues here. So it does require, um, you know, quite a lot of work around kind of building um, that, that capacity uh, um, and kind of in, in line with that, that threat environment. Muti, if you would like to complete on, on those closing words. 
Yeah, I'd like to agree with the skin as well. Um, we have seen a proliferation of digital services uh, demanded by government, demanded by the private sector as a result of uh, COVID. If things that allow people to do, uh, you know, carry out services remotely. Um, and they've been done at a rather pace. Uh, so, of course, the technical debt for security has built up, even if the incidents may not yet have started uh, building up, but, but it, it, it's there, uh, it's coming. Um, so yes, I do subscribe to the fact that COVID has had as a result of its uh, trigger to, to have a lot of organizations go digital. Uh, in terms of uh, whether Africa is ready, uh, you know, it's, I have a mixed uh, response there. I don't think anyone is ever ready. Um, so it's, it's uh, the, the most advanced countries are still facing large breaches. Uh, so one could ask if they're ready, why, why are these things still happening? So in that sense, I say, I don't think anyone is ever ready. Um, but having said that, uh, we need to, that the Africans just need to know that these threats exist. Uh, you could argue that, you know, also most of the systems in this part of the world are manual and paper-based. So as a result, even if one wanted to be uh, Type breaches the likes of, of you know maybe an attack on the Pentagon, you know the, you're not going to you're not going to be successful. It's, it's, it's paper based, but as we go digital, uh, we just need to be aware um, that these threats exist and the solutions are very well known. And it's not something that you get ready once. You have to constantly be on your toes and evolving as the threats evolve. Thank you very much, uh, Timothy, for, for those conclusion words. Um, Finn, I'm going to end up with uh, you, uh, Esbon. What, what is your take on the COVID-19 impact and also on the overall question, cybersecurity, is Africa ready? Uh, Mr. Malbay? Uh, maybe. The threats, of course, were increased. One is that when the usage goes high, inevitably then the threats will go high. And when, when the usage goes high, the threats also would uh, certainly go high. And uh, definitely more people, or even the people who were already now, now they made more use of them. Like in Kenya, when you go on the M-Pesa platform, most of the shops or anywhere you go, people didn't want to to hold money, physical. They wanted you have to pay on, uh, using the M-Pesa platform. So that meant that even if you had money, you would not then do the physical transaction. So certainly when such things come up, and especially money, then uh, you get to see more threats. Now, number two, as to whether the Africa is ready, uh that question is ma maybe much more better answered from a, a segmented point of view other than looking at it uh, holistically one uh, the cyber security in africa is not necessarily addressed from one given common front so as a country individual countries you do your own you come up with your own policies to ensure that uh, you 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 you, you tackle the issue of the, the cyber threats. And uh, therefore, I wouldn't really want to put numbers on that because they will keep varying the issue of percentage. But uh, certainly, uh, the issue of being ready, uh, you, it, it might be very a little bit hard also to generalize. It will depend from one country to another how much they put in. Because also, we have to remember that uh, cyber security uh, it's an issue of resourcing as well number one and also the issue of capacity building so the two things
Uh, unfortunately, it seems we we have lost uh, Mr. Malvay when he was saying. Um, I'm not sure you, it, he's back. But regardless, we are getting really close. Uh, we are beyond the time of our conversation for by five minutes, and there is a, an amazing um, debate that has just started on the main stage. Uh, I want to thank you, thanks the three of you. Thank you very much, Tina Connor. Thank you, Timothy Museke, for joining us. And of course, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eswan Malvayi, representing Kenyan ICT Ministry. Um, I'm sure that the conversation and the insights that you have brought today have been uh, of great value to our audience. So goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.